Welcome to the uh, Knowledge Exchange event that's being co-organised by the Chartered Institute of Architectural Technologists, Scotland East Region, and the Scottish Ecological Design Association, CEDA. So this is uh, the second in, uh, in a four, three or four part series on retrofitting for the future. Uh, we kicked off our retrofit series back on the 30th of uh, June, and this is the first one we're partnering with uh, CEDA, and we will have another one next week, which will continue on the same theme of retrofit for the future, looking at retrofit methods, looking at retrofit application of, um, of technologies and such. So uh, I'm going to just give a little bit of background on uh, CIAT Scotland East Region for a few seconds, just for those who are joining us from uh, other mailing lists who may not be familiar with exactly how we operate and what our remit is. Uh, and then I will move over to introducing both of our speakers who are very pleased to be joining us today. And then we will move through the two speakers, Catherine and Tilio. And then we'll, we'll close up close to around quarter to two, two, all being well, and we'll have some questions. So uh, I have this little infographic here just to give a little bit of context about who about who CIAT Scotland East Region are and where we fit in as an organisation into the grander scheme of things. So the regional committee uh, within this Chartered Institute of Architectural Technologists uh, have 14, 15, 16 regions in the UK and we are made up with a set of committee members and officers. And those officers are people who have responsibility for specific elements of the of promoting CIAT in the Scotland East region. Now we act on behalf and represent the voice of architectural technologists in the Scotland East region. And then we also uh, represent and participate on behalf of architectural technologists in our region to the CIAT Global Forums. And we also work uh, to safeguard the best interests of ATs in Scotland. Uh, in many respects, we, uh, we are the interface between, the committee itself is the interface between ATs uh, on the ground who are doing the day-to-day -day stuff and with CIAT Global and their aspirations and how they're moving forward. Now, we uh, also are supported by a steering group of ATs from private practice, academia, research, house builders, and nearly every other specialization you can think of for architectural technology. So whilst the officers are just on screen at the moment, we have 22 odd members in our steering group that help to uh, drive our agendas and help us achieve the things we need to, to promote architectural technology and the furthest different themes. Now, just quickly before I move on to introducing the event and our speakers, just a, a small reference to aspirations. Aspirations are the main platform that we as a region use to engage with our educational partners including alumna, alumni and early career architectural technologists and they too are supported by students and postgrads um, from the various high and further education institutes that deliver an architectural technology program or an AT related course. So that gives you a little bit of understanding of where we are within this particular realm of knowledge exchange. So on to today's event, I am extremely privileged and very proud to be introducing uh, two speakers who will be very well known to many of you here today uh, and very well experienced uh, and travelled in terms of the sustainable, sustainability approaches to energy efficiency, retrofit, refurbishment, repair, uh, restoration and renovation. So we have a uh, Catherine uh, Cosgrove, an associate at Austin Smith and Lord, and the chair for the Scottish Ecological Design Association. Catherine is joining us today to give a little bit of introduction uh, to CEDA, like I have just done for CIAT Scotland East, but then she'll be discussing uh, more about her approaches to sustainable retrofit and renovation to the A-listed Confucius Institute which was a University of Shathclyde project uh, that has been completed recently. So 
After that, we will then hear from uh, Julio Bros Williamson, uh, a, a doctor at the Scottish Energy uh, Centre and the, at the uh, Edinburgh Napier University. Julio is joining us then to discuss uh, and compare the methods of plot renewal and deep retrofit and the difference between the two and how both can be applied in a real world context to a post-1919 four and a block archetype with a specific focus on applying the Scottish Building Standards Section 7 for sustainability to existing buildings. So uh, thank you very much again to Catherine and Julio for joining us this afternoon. I am now going to pass over to Catherine. So Catherine, when you're ready, just you steal my screen share and uh, start sharing your own slides. Right, we'll just put this on. Uh, right, can everyone see that okay? Yeah, thumbs up, John. Yeah. Thank you. Um, a brief introduction to the Scottish Ecological Design Association. Um, I, I know some people will already know us, but I'm hoping that we've got um, a, a wider audience than we're, this is the first time you've heard of us. Um, we, are, we have been around for 30 years. Um, we are founded um, to promote and share information about all forms of sustainable and ecological design. Um, we've got a very widespread membership. Um, it's not just architects. Um, we've, we've got landscape architects, we've got engineers, we've got um, material suppliers, we've workers, all sorts of people. Um, and how we spread that information and knowledge uh, is usually through um, publications and seminars. Um, we've had to move online like everybody else in, in this last um, year and a half. Um, but we've also got information on our website, we have our quarterly magazine, we put design guides and a number of, of other things that we've gone through the years. Um, just to let you know, we have these freely available design guides available on our website, um, which we've created over the years. Um, there's a new one will be coming out later this year, um, a, a guide for um, healthy indoor air quality. Um, and we've got a couple of books um, which we've also published. The Sustainable Renovation Guide is available for free on our website as well. That's um, published along with the Pebble Trust. Um, the 100 Scottish Sustainable Buildings, that is one you have to pay for, but there are still plenty of copies, so feel free to come and get your copy at our website. Um, and later on this year, um, we'll be publishing our, our Land Conversations um, summary of um, seminars that we had earlier this year, um, which was a very well-attended series, really interesting about lots of different land uses um, and things which could and will be affecting them in future. Um, that We've got recordings of that available on our website if anybody wants to go and see um, some of the previous seminars. We've also got recordings of, of our last couple of conferences, um, including the, the 2020 conference, which was um, Build Back Better. The one that we've just finished um, in, in June um, was about Time for Action and, and it's all manner of things, partly looking back over the 30 years that CEDA has been around and also looking to the future as to, to what we think um, are going to be the important topics over the next 10 years. And like I said, the Land, the land Conversation Seminars, um, which was six separate evenings that we held them on, um, completely in-depth, um, discussions with many, many people who were involved in um, land use, um, different aspects of land use across Scotland and actually just getting them to talk to each other. So we had six separate themes um, and raised all sorts of issues from it. Um, so th that will do for it just now, I think, a brief introduction to see that. Please go onto our website and I I'm, I'm sure we can, uh, you'll find something there that will be of interest to you. Superb. Thanks, Catherine. Okay. Julio, that, uh, that brings you up to the, the batting plate a bit sooner than expected. Are you good to go? Yes, I am. I'll, I'll, I'll try and, and uh, share my screen. Super. Thanks, Julio. Hopefully that's in front yep. of everyone. Yep, I've got, your, I've got your slide just now, Julio. Got the white background with uh, your title on it. Perfect. Okay. Um, well, um, just to say thank you, thank you very much, John, for that uh, um, introduction at the very start. Uh, and uh, welcome, welcome everyone um, to this to this series of, of talks. Um, and uh, and yeah, this is a I'll be presenting a project that I've been involved in uh, over the years, um, and still kind of developing some some research around it. Um, I've been at uh, Edinburgh Napier now for uh, nearly 13 years and we've focused a lot of our work around um, 
retrofit at existing buildings. Um, we're also looking at uh, complex uh, uh, methods uh, to, to implement retrofit, um, looking at uh, the use of different materials, um, insulation materials particularly, into existing forms of, uh, of, of buildings and, and also existing um, um, materials. Um, so, so that integration between new and old has been very much um, a focus of, of research. But this this project uh, today that, that I hope to to, to kind of uh, talk through is um, is looking at deep retrofit um, of existing buildings, uh, particularly around uh, those um, that are um, uh, traditional built, traditionally built, but but definitely uh, have have it, their complexities. Um, but also an alternative, looking at the plot renewal, which is which might be a, a, a new scheme for for many of you out there, um, and hopefully I can explain that further in the next couple of slides. So, so just just kind of a brief uh, outline of the contents. Um, I'll, I'll go through an introduction, then a, a brief overview of of uh, of some of the the important parts as a background. Um, and 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 kind of the, the drivers around around what we're doing, um, some of the kind of design expectations and and, and kind of elements around that, um, and also looking into um, the different schemes um, of plot renewal and, and the retrofit uh, options that we went through. Um, we also um, have some hard evidence of, of performance, particularly on the on the retrofit. Um, so I'll be going through some of the methods of evaluation and monitoring. Um, a kind of brief outline of also of the results, and and some finished kind of photographs of of the retrofit. Um, and I mean, what's interesting about this uh, scheme is that we were we did have that opportunity to to compare them. Um, looking at embodied carbon and to understand uh, the differences between retrofit and, and other alternatives and, and to see what, what was the best option um, in carbon emission aspects, embodied carbon in particular. Um, so in terms of an introduction, uh, really the aim and obje objectives of today's talk discusses the proposed retrofit of a four and a block uh, housing um, housing block. There's uh, there's a considerable amount of them uh, out there uh, that are either derelict or, or or in very poor conditions. And also looking at the implementation of the plot renewal scheme, um, which uh, might be new to to many of you. The objectives looking at demonstrating some of the techniques um, so I'll, I'll go through some of them there's, there's not enough time for for all of them but but definitely try to to point out some of the important ones um, and and also show some of the the carbon emissions uh, in the comparison and understand how how this has an impact on the, on the urban uh, landscape and 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 uh, an image of 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 streetscapes in Scotland which sadly have, have been um, kind of been hit uh, over the years by areas that are no longer in use, um, abandoned, and, and giving quite a, a, a bad reputation to a lot of our really nice towns um, around the central belt and, and, and around Scotland. So trying to kind of reactivate that, and, and hopefully this, this kind of uh, does that in, in some way. So as a background, uh, four and a block properties are flats that are um, have a common block um, and are distributed into into four different flats. Um, there are different styles and uh, and and designs out there, uh, and and uh, and the difference really lies around the access to the different flats. Some of them will have their own uh, independent access. Um, some others will uh, have a, a common access uh, and staircase to the top and, and the ground floors. Um, so there's different designs out there, uh, and uh, and there are some distinctions between 
uh, um, different regions, uh, some of the Glasgow, Forna Block, some of the, the Fife uh, and Centre Park, and, and also Edinburgh and Elodian. So, so there's kind of um, some distinguished uh, elements around there. Um, they were all built really the kind of um, during and, and post-war, uh, the majority of them, uh, particularly um, around the, the kind of 1950s, 60s um, and, and kind of late 60s essentially. And at the moment, uh, through the house condition survey done in, in Scotland, there are approximately 240,000 still remaining in, in Scotland, uh, occupied the majority of them. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, there are some that have been just abandoned and derelict just because of their of their high cost in running, um, poor thermal conditions and uh, and acoustic conditions as well. Um, they were definitely um, part of this fast track and fast approach um, of building uh, uh, af during and after the the the, the, the two wars. Um, and uh, and definitely um, were were poorly constructed with um, with with kind of um, so a lot of problems. Uh, some of them structural. Um, the use of low fines was quite uh, prominent, predominant, uh, but particularly very poorly thermally performing um, uh, conditions in, in a lot of these. So, I mean, I've got two images there of some typical um, styles and, and types of Forna blocks, um, different roof uh, configurations and access configurations, as I mentioned, and uh, and, and different uh, external cladding and 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 and, uh, and, and aesthetic kind of uh, uh, solutions as well. So I'll start off with plot renewal, which I think is a very exciting. A way of, of looking at reactivating towns and, and certainly uh, buildings that are uh, not in use anymore. So it basically is a, a way of reusing a, a great part of, the, of, of, of a series of buildings that are going to be deemed for demolishment, demolishing. Um, and instead of demolishing it all, um, uh, we're trying to see ways in which we can rescue um, part of the of, of the structure, and primarily we focus on the larger uh, um, carbon content, which in a lot of cases is the use of concrete. Um, so we're looking to to um, to to keep the majority of the foundations of of homes, and to be able to. Um, to build on top of those existing foundations and maybe a lightweight solution, um, something that is new build, but is reusing the foundations that, that used to be there in place. Um, there is the option also to be using a lot of the aggregates from the demolition um, and surrounding soft and hard uh, landings, um, but definitely it's the foundations that, that, that we'd be, be keeping as much as possible. And if the design allows for a larger uh, plot or a larger um, uh, kind of space, um, extending that if necessary. Uh, but, but there's a substantial saving there in terms of, of the use of, of concrete. Um, there are also options um, and plot renewal looks to uh, increasing the density if that's, if that's possible. Um, the reason for is a lot of the the, the foreigner blocks um, have quite large bedrooms. Uh, the majority between three and two bedrooms, uh, so there is space there if if that if the project allows and, and requires to 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 densify increase the density and, and add some more. So it could be that instead of having four apartments, it could be that you add a, a, a fifth one. Um, um, some of the benefits, the reuse of existing uh, footprints, if, if that's the case, um, looking at building more energy efficient homes, um, whereas before it would have been a der derelict and very poorly performing uh, building, higher density I, I, I mentioned, um, and kind of that reactivation of, of towns, looking at uh, the reuse of, of streetscapes and, and derelict homes that, that uh, sadly in a lot of towns and 
um, that's the case. Um, and, and that improvement of the urban image is, is really important as well. So the, the example that I'll be talking about today is located in uh, the, the, the Fife uh, town of Loch Gelly um, and the Hoare. Uh, and and this is a, a, a street that um, has or what had gone through uh, lots of ownership issues uh, from the council to 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 other others for for redevelopment, and finally it it got to um, a series of uh, well a, a kind of grouping between five council um, and a series of contractors where. There was an option for complete demolishment and and a new build uh, built instead. But we came in, into into the, the this stage uh, before uh, demolishment, where we there was an opportunity to to trial the plot renewal, and also to look into ways of retrofitting. Um, so these four photographs show um, what used to be the case of this town. As you can see, a very abandoned and, and kind of uh, uh, kind of poorly uh, imaged uh, uh, urban scape um, with boarded up uh, properties and, and just complete uh, derelict and abandoned areas, um, which doesn't really uh, bring much motivation to, to the surrounding uh, town uh, occupiers and, and, and visitors. So from this, we came up with the, the use of plot renewal uh, with, a, with a series of contractors and Fife Council and came up with a more revitalised uh, streetscape, new build um, on top of the existing uh, uh, foundations uh, and, and, and a much um, better uh, looking uh, streetscape and use of, of these areas. Um, but while this was happening, um, and while the demolition of the superstructure was, was happening, there was an opportunity also to trial the use of retrofit and deep retrofit. So we came to the conclusion of, of leaving one of the four the blocks that were in the street and to engage with the team, with the contractors and, and five council to come up with deep retrofit solutions that would have this additional option, if, if that was the case, um, to to trial different options of, of of retrofit, to look at different solutions, different materials, different forms of of improvement or thermally essentially for 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 the blocks um, that could be hopefully replicated in other towns if plot renewal wasn't implemented in the first place. Um, but I mean that the element of of, uh, of redensification of these areas was also an issue, and trying to um, not not just uh, have more families in, in these, but also look at the at, at the benefits of that, and looking at ways in which uh, we can take advantage of of certain areas, gap sites, um, and areas that, that weren't used. Um, and also look at, at the more efficient distribution of, of, of areas um, and, uh, and housing in general. So we came up with, with also uh, schemes around the reuse of these spaces, whether it was plot renewal or, or whether it was gap sites, um, and came up with different schemes for the council and, and the contractors to, to, to look into um, and, and, and hopefully, if possible, implement the plot renewal um, option as well. So, uh, Edward Napier was involved in the design and, and, and kind of looking at, at these different options, and, and I believe it was part of a, of a, of a master's uh, dissertation as well. So, moving on to the, the kind of four a block retrofit, which was really a very exciting stage for us, and, and, and one that we were very curious on how we could address the, the, the state and the derelict state that, that these uh, four blocks were in already. Um, now, a lot of the solutions that we came up with uh, were, were made with, a, with an option for replicating in, in the future. Um, and, and also with the understanding that different buildings will have different conditions and, uh, and indeed not all buildings, not all four blocks will be unoccupied. There will also be an option where people will still be in these properties, and uh, and maybe the retrofit option will be will be different. 
So, so we looked at, at different options, different ways of, of, uh, of coming up with retrofit solutions. Um, and as I mentioned, this, this block in particular, <coughs> excuse me, um, looked at uh, very uh, uh, kind of poorly uh, uh, state uh, conditions. And we did have to go right to the core of the building structure um, and uh, and try to strip it all out as, and, and, and assess the condition of it in, in, in great deal. So there's a lot of replacement of, of timber uh, joists um, and, and the structure in general. And in this particular project, uh, we actually had to replace it, the, the roof itself. But we did recognise that a lot of the buildings uh, surrounding for retrofit uh, would not have to go through this. So, so we did have to go through a new, a new uh, roof, and indeed it was quite an innovative roof that we came up with. It was an uh, off-site built roof that was craned into position on top of the existing structure. Um, so the building is traditionally built with uh, block, uh, brick and block cavities, uh, timber roof structure, uh, and there was some insulation present in some of the, the walls uh, and, and, and the roof uh, structure, but it was minimal and because of its state, it was it was unusable, it, was, it had to be stripped out. As I mentioned Sorry. earlier. Sorry, Hillary, I'm interrupting you there. It's uh, five minutes to go. Okay, thanks. These are our, our bed, uh, three bedroom flats. So the proposal was to, to look at ways in which we can retrofit uh, in a more innovative way and also look at ways in which we can assess it uh, differently. And, uh, and we came up with uh, as aspirational kind of performance of retrofit. Now, we looked at the implementation of the Section 7 building regulations here in Scotland and um, which are, are typically used for new builds, but we wanted to look at how how the, the Section 7 could be implemented into retrofit as well, and, and obviously report back and see um, what differences had to be made. So we looked at applying the gold, silver and bronze level of, of Section 7 with active uh, uh, ventilation and also passive uh, ventilation and heating uh, systems. But through value engineering and also um, the contractors and, and, and the budget, um, there was there was some kind of conflictive uh, aspects there. We kept the, the, the two gold uh, 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 sustainable uh, uh, standards. We had a, 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 a silver one and also the bronze with different configurations and different insulation aspects. Um, we looked at external insulation in the in the top two flats, um, roof insulation as well, topping up that within that new roof, and in the in the in the lower flats we looked at uh, inserting uh, insulation inside the cavity and also having internal insulation. So different configurations and different solutions. We also wanted to trial different systems uh, for heating. For saving heat, so we had uh, a combined. Uh, so we had a uh, combi boilers with uh, with uh, different energy efficient uh, saving options. Uh, we had cylinders with underfloor heating, with radiators as well, and others in the flat. Uh, we also had mechanical ventilation with heat recovery, uh, particularly in the gold one. So, so different kind of technologies to see their efficiency and see how they would be used. And also more uh, specific um, uh, controls, uh, which would be really interesting. In terms of the testing, we looked at uh, deploying and, and, and applying air tightness testing um, once they were complete and, and the retrofit was, was, was finalised. Look at U-value testing uh, of the walls, particularly infrared thermography, and also looking at ways in which we could compare the design aspired uh, calculations against actual energy use after occupation. So, so that was something that we, we looked at, 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 at doing as well, which we did. In terms of air, air permeability tests, um, we were aspiring at a five uh, meters cubed, um, but sadly um, after completion and, and once we did uh, the test, um, the, that increased uh, substantially, particularly 
in, 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 in certain flats, in, in, in the top flats, etc. So, so that was kind of a, a bit disappointing, but um, there was remediation that, that could have gone through after that. And some, some, uh, some, some kind of key areas that that we had to be really look for uh, at in more detail: connection points of services, gaps around these, um, cornicing that we were trying to replicate from the original, um, where there was gaps and a lot of movement within the structure, um, and also uh, the, the new kind of uh, dry linings and and and, and wet uh, linings that, that were kind of uh, added, uh, created cracks, etc. Uh, skirtings and, and floor uh, gaps, etc., that, that, that were just kind of created, um, and, and just by poorly assembling and, and the contractor not really paying much attention. Um, so just some comparisons there on new value. Um, some of the aspired as designed um, around the 0 0.13, 0 0.15, um, much lower, and as built, um, sadly, in some cases, um, much higher. Than, than what we had anticipated. And some, some areas that were of concern, particularly in the, between the walls and the eaves of the roof. Now, just finally, trying to look at some of the comparisons of carbon, um, both carbon, embodied carbon and also operational carbon. Um, through the SAP uh, 2009 uh, evaluations that we did at the time, we looked at the operational carbon um, around 15, 16 uh, meters cubed, uh, sorry, kilograms of CO2 per meters cubed, meters squared. Um, and, uh, and we look to also assess uh, the cradle to gate um, carbon emissions, embodied carbon of, of the, the different uh, options. So we analyze the retrofit against the plot renewal option and also against an equivalent um, new build um, on the same conditions. So some of the, the, the kind of differences there of between the, the retrofit, the port renewal and new build, uh, the new build having considerably more uh, embodied carbon, uh, and this was primarily because they were going to propose a new foundation. So there's a lot of savings there in terms of, the, of keeping that, that new foundation, which is kept within the, the retrofit and the plot renewal. Um, and that's in the ground floors, in the top floors. It kind of evens out between the three, um, but uh, some some more uh, on others. And and just in, in a bit more detail there, again, the comparison between them, the blue being the operational against um, the, the embodied carbon in other, uh, in, in the different configurations um, and, and looking at how much more there is in terms of new build compared with the plot renewal and the retrofit. And just finally, some images of the finished blocks um, of that particular uh, retrofit. It really revitalised that street. It revitalised a lot of the, the adjoining streets. Um, and we had a lot of good and positive uh, interaction from the neighbours. And, and it's just so so nice to, to be in, in those spaces now, in those, those streets with, with new builds, a bit of freshened up uh, space and, and occupied spaces as well. Um, so hopefully this has been an interesting kind of introduction to plot renewal and, and some of the deep retrofit options. Um, and, uh, and happy to answer any questions at the end, um, if that's possible. Super, thanks. thanks. Thanks very much, Julio. Um, getting some questions in the chat for you. I'm going to compile all those. And any we don't get answered today, we will we'll get answers for you eventually and get back to you. Um, Julio, uh, we'll talk a little bit later on about the kind of different methods, but there's very distinct challenges using existing cavities and using existing foundations and, and such would have been around for quite some time. Um, so, yeah, some conversations to have be had there. But thanks very much for giving us a very, very concise introduction to all of this. Lots of open ended kind of conversations to be had. So we may we may have you back in the future for a, a longer event if we need to. Right, I'm going to uh, welcome Catherine back. So, Catherine, um, are you? Oh. Yes, you're with us. Fantastic. Are we? Are we? Are we good to go? We we should be good to go. Um, I can't say that the last time it was necessarily a technical problem. It may well have been 
a, a user problem by this end. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's see. If I'll, I'll canter through this, and then hopefully I'll be able to unshare my screen later on. Super, Again, thanks. let's see. Right, okay. Um, we've got a slightly different approach to, to Hulu's, um, and, and this is um, a project that we worked on um, with the University of Strathclyde. Very quickly, Austin Smith Lord, we're a, a UK practice. We've got five studios, um, but we all work together as one. So I've been working on sustainability projects for mainly the last 15 years, but also more recently, um, conservation projects um, and actually where the two of these overlap is where you get um, retrofit. So the project I'm going to talk to you about is the Confucius Institute uh, in Glasgow which we did for Strathclyde University which didn't start out as a sustainable project, it didn't even start out as a conservation project, it started out because the Confucius Institute who were based at in one of the departments at Strathclyde University were given a grant by the Chinese government to become a model institute um, and that Part of the conditions for um, obtaining the grant was that they had to be in a standalone building. And the only building which was available in the Strathclyde University campus was the, the Ramshorn Church. Um, this was a building which um, the university had um, taken on the management of in the, I think it was late um, 1980s, um, and they converted it into their theatre. It's an important building for the university because the founder of the university, John Anderson, was a, an elder at the church. Um, so it was, there was there's quite a lot of links that they'd had in the past. And when it came, um, an opportunity came to, to take over the building, um, the, like I said, they turned it into the theatre. But for the 10 years before we got involved in the project, the building was largely unused. They mothballed the theatre and they had the space available um, just as decant space that they used for other things. Um, but the intention was that it was going to be handed back to Glasgow City Council. Um, so they hadn't done an awful lot of maintenance on it and they certainly hadn't been spending too much money at the time um, when it was available for use. Um, externally, mainly in good condition. Um, there were some known problems, mainly related to some roof leaks in a couple of places. Um, the building fabric of the original church was in very good condition. The building fabric of the elements that had been added later on had started to deteriorate in a couple of places. So this was one of the challenges that we were going to be facing from the outset of we were looking at the existing church and what it meant and how, how, to, how to keep the A-listed building status of it. But actually, we were also looking for the long-term use of it. So how we approached the whole project was, let's start by looking at the history of the building. Let's establish the significance, establish what's important of it. Go back into the archives and find information about how it was originally built. And that process, we uncovered the original drawings or as many of the original drawings as we could. Um, the most important one that we found was the um, building warrant for the church hall, which was built in 1899. Um, it was the same architects that did the church um, and they'd clearly been brought on to do a very specific job. Um, there had been a couple of changes at various times over the life of the building, but this was the large extension that was put on at the back. It's only one drawing, but that one drawing gave us so much information, it basically set out how we would then approach the rest of the, the work. Um, there had been some changes in this area in subsequent years um, and we didn't have records of that. So we could see at some point what had started off life as a, an open undercroft had been filled in, um, which had windows put on both sides. And then there was a, a later block just around the corner from it, um, which added in stairs and toilet provision. Um, the church itself um, did have a gallery space, so there were stairs that led up through that. But when it was changed in the 1990s, um, largely there were some alterations inside. There were some structural changes um, and the, the hall at the back was being used for changing spaces and rehearsal spaces for the theatre group, whereas the main church was converted into um, the theatre space. I'll show you very quickly what it was that, that we, we aimed to do because the, the two parts of the, the project that we had here was partly was the offices for the Confucius Institute staff and for Scotland's National Centre for Languages and then the, the theatre space was going to become their lecture space and event space. Um, so when we looked at the two areas we went right okay there, there are a few bits in the existing hall that possibly could be taken out and rearranged. The biggest challenge that we were having to meet in this project was everything within the performance space was only accessible via staircases. Every access into that space was up, up quite a steep flight of steps, so it was no way accessible for anyone. 
Um, and also the within the hall space at the back, there was a drop in height between one side of the building and the other. So again, there was no level access. Um, there was one existing goods lift, which was um, at the west side at the back corner where there are a number of windows, but the goods lift had managed to block out four of the five windows which were in that side of the building. So when we were looking at all the various different options that we could do, um, we took a very bold decision of taking out the existing lift, putting in a new lift, but actually going back as closely as we could to what original layouts were going to be. Um, so previous windows which had been blocked up, we decided that we would unblock them again and we would focus those that end of the building would be where the offices were. Um, that's the ground floor. Um, just in case you're wondering, the large open space on the right hand side is actually the crypt underneath the church. Yes, there are bodies buried there. And if you go to the building, that's the first thing everyone wants to see is inside the crypt. We weren't allowed to do any work within there, although there is a plant room within it. It's a bit of an awkward space. But it, it did mean that, that largely what we were looking at in the ground floor was focused on one side. On the upper floor, again, split into two parts, the, where the theatre space had been, that's the new lecture space, we didn't do an awful lot within that. But within the hall space at the back, we took precedent from the original drawings. This had been built so that it was largely an open plan space with a vestry at one side, which had a small toilet off the side of it. So our proposals were to actually go back to pretty much the original layout with a few tweaks here and there and the new left added in. But the most important thing from the sustainability point of view was originally that space did have um, four banks of roof lights over the top of it because the challenges with heating, lighting and ventilation are not new challenges. They were always there. So we decided that the most sustainable thing to do, which actually worked out in conservation terms, was to try and return to the original design, which was to add back in the roof lights. So opening up the windows, adding back the roof lights in there gave a more usable space, something that could be used better in the long term. Um, and of course, it completely met with um, our, under our, our aim to try and better understand how the building had been built and constructed in the first place. Um, in terms of the sustainability side of things, now bear in mind we have a tight budget, all the services in the building needed to be replaced, there were many changes internally, we had a new lift to add um, and, and there were quite a number of specific issues which I will talk about in a moment which we uncovered and we were told to do our best for what we could manage in terms of sustainability. So thinking about it and going, OK, well, with a very small pot of money, there'll be some areas where we are going to be um, opening up so we can look at retrofitting those. There are other areas which have already had a little bit of work done on them. Maybe we can supplement that. And then where are the staff going to be most frequently based? And the answer was in the, the hall at the back. Um, so what we aimed to do was um, add in um, some timber insulation around the, the, per the perimeter of the footprint of the offices. Um, we were working within the roof, so we renewed all the insulation within the roof spaces. And we just tried to make it as consistent as possible so that there was no one bit was going to be worse than anything else. Um, and addressing building fabric issues from the outside and addressing the roof issues would mean that it would be more wind and water tight. That was as much as we could manage within the budget. But we did say to um, the university, OK, this is the first step in a multi-step process. And you should really be looking at the same type of thing on the main church building if you have funding available. So basically, we, we, we try to draw like a perimeter around the whole thing and say, we'll concentrate what we can on what we're, we're doing on the outside and try and improve the base of building fabric. So th this is basically, this is a building want drawing show you where the changes that we made. It's actually very little changes, but hopefully they affect the performance of the spaces. Putting the roof lights in was a, a, a lot of benefit from this. One of which was um, the spaces that we were taking out the slates gave us quite a stock of slates that then could be used for other roof repairs. Um, in fact, we actually kept some that were surplus to the repairs uh, and they are now stored within the crypt um, so they can be used for future repairs. But what we discovered when we started trying to put the roof lights in was that the roof was actually slightly squint. Um, and of course, going back and looking at information that we'd had, you go, oh, right, yeah, you can see that there's been a few wee twists here and there. Um, and one of the things which we did at this point while we were still fitting the roof lights was we, we got a 3D scan carried out within the space. 
Um, and then our engineers um, took that information and rebuilt the, the structure in Revit to check where the loading was going down in various places because they were a bit worried that one of the roof trusses had slipped and twisted slightly and that actually that was maybe putting loading on the wrong places now. Um, so that's something that maybe in hindsight we would do earlier in the process the next time rather than doing it when we were on site. Unfortunately, it was just a case of, of adding in a few ties in a few places and an awful lot more brackets and there didn't seem to be any movement, but it was one of the lessons learned from it it was like right, okay there's a way to use technology in future another unexpected thing and um, with older buildings you can always expect the unexpected is that we discovered um, when we were um, uncovering works that the there was some steel structure set and set within the walls that the steel structure was rusting to such a point that the engineers were a bit worried about whether there was going to be um certain areas that would have to be replaced. Now, this was a significant problem because, as it turns out, the church hall had been built directly on top of the old graveyard wall. What they had done was they put a couple of steels on top of the wall, the full length of the, the wall, and then they built stone on top of that. And it was going to be really difficult to try and get in there and replace the steel. And, I mean, when we, we thought about it, it was a case of, well, where can you put scaffolding? How can you put ties through? How can you put props through? How can you get access to this? How do you be able to support a building while we're replacing all of the structure along the full length? The, the other side of the building where we had the same problem was less of an issue because it was better access. There was relatively easy um, areas where we could identify how we could put in temporary structure to make it work. But the place where we couldn't change things was that full length along the graveyard wall and we actually chose not to replace the steel but what we did do was we come up with a, a solution which was adding um, a catalytic, um, what do you call it? Oh, I forgot the name of it. There's a system where it, it basically you connect a battery up to the whole thing and it slows down the rate of decay that was happening within the steelwork. Um, and we, it's something that will last us for 25 years. It has to be monitored every year. We left pockets in the inside so you could take out um, parts of the wall and have a look and see the condition was okay. Um, but it's a managed process rather than solving the problem. Um, and we accepted that under the conditions that we were working with and and understanding how the building was to be used, all we can do at this point is identify this is a problem and this is how we're managing it. And that's something that the university reckoned was the best thing that they could do at this moment in time. Um, so not every problem in a retrofit is something which you can then s solve with technology. Um, I'll give you a few po photographs just to show how it's turned out and I'll explain some of the things that work better. All the windows that you can see on the west side of the building here had previously been blocked up. So one of the retrofit solutions was actually open up the windows, make better use of the ventilation, get daylight in there. And that, that was a relatively simple thing to do, but actually it required removing the lift to be able to do that. Um, within the roof space, um, putting in the new roof lights worked extremely well. And it's something that you go, OK, right, That they were very expensive roof lights that we had to put in, but they address quite a number of the problems with how the space is managed. Um, and it's something that I think everyone agreed straight away as soon as you were in those spaces, what a difference it made just by having the top lights in there. Um, within the, the, the front of house spaces, there was very little that we could spend our money on at this moment in time. But there are certain things which we have identified that should be the next steps for the university. Um, one of the benefits of, of being able to um, work on the existing buildings was that th that we could re-establish effectively the importance of the, the stained glass windows. These are one of the critical things in the listing of the building. Um, there is some um, glass protection on the outside of the stained glass windows, which the way it has been installed, which was absolutely correct at the time when it was it was first refurbished, is not something that we would do now. And one of the problems that's an ongoing issue is that um, the, the, the side that faces the sun can heat up quite substantially and the protective glass on the outside um, has a tendency to break. Um, and we did say, look, in the long term, you probably want to change that detail, but in the short term, all we can do just now is replace the broken glass. It is a problem that's going to recur, but it is something that you probably have to look at this specifically as a secondary project at some point into the next couple of years. Um, on the 
photograph that's on the right hand side you maybe see up at the very top the the rose feature up there um, is actually the ventilation system um again we couldn't replace the ventilation system we just didn't have any money for it so it's basically just overhauled and made sure that it works um but it is something that again it will have a limited lifespan and they're going to have to seriously consider how that's going to work in the, the time of the building but for the purposes that it's needed for just now it was a case of just making do with what we had and making sure that it worked and extending its life and it was the same for the big services within the building there was an awful lot of it we just had to retain and and say okay this has got a, a probable lifespan of this amount of time and then we will go back to it. The black box theatre space, this was a before and after just to let you see it. It really was something that sucked in the light if you went to see it to begin with and they had hidden all of the lovely stained glass windows within there. Um, we, we have kept it largely intact um, but basically opened it up so that it's far brighter in there and a completely sort of different feeling of space. Um, there are certain parts of it again which if we had the money, we would have gone back and changed specifically in the building fabric um, because um, as uh, the previous restoration, they have added in, um, I think, a plastic vapour control layer, um, which is the one thing that long term in the listed building gives me a little bit of concern because there might be, if this was a better used space and it was very well heated, I think there potentially could be condensation and moisture issues in there and that might have a fabric implication in the long term. Um, so, But all we've done just now is identified what we've found and said, right, OK, this is something that you need to consider. Here's what we would do if it was going to be the next steps. So as, as I was saying, part of this process that we were going through was we couldn't do everything we wanted to do in the building. Um, but what we did say at the end was, OK, we'll give you a maintenance guide. We'll identify each of the areas where we've either had to make changes, we've had to done some maintenance on it, or else the things which you are going to have to monitor what's happening with it because it is likely to be needed um, some form of investment down the line. Um, so we gave the university a whole series of, of, sort of specific things to look at and included within that we said right here's all the materials that we've used to date so it's a, a first stop whenever you need to do any subsequent repairs and um, we also gave them an estimation of what we thought was going to be the lifespan of some of the materials that were used because again this might be something that they choose to invest in particular things at some point down the line but what we're doing is Effectively, the, we're doing the thinking up front and then saying, OK, this is a multi-year process. We've done the first step and then you can pick that up and take it on in subsequent years. So I think this is the most important thing I wanted to try and get across to you is actually the process, because we've evolved the process through working on this project and other projects, which applies quite well to all sorts of retrofit projects. Um, I mean, we developed it for use with, with um, listed buildings and heritage buildings, but actually, you know, it works quite well for everything. So I'd say the first thing is historic research, which is really just finding out as much as you can about the building to begin with. Um, whether it's original drawings or photographs, we've done quite a lot of photographs in the past, but pretty much identify what are the known changes, how many times it's changed throughout the life of, of, of been used. And also don't always believe that what you get in drawings is correct. So you have to verify the information. Um, you have to um, make sure that what you've got on drawings was actually built. Not always the case with historic drawings. Um, you have to carry out building investigations to find out what's there. And I point you back towards the don't find the rusting structure when you're in the middle of the work on site. Would have been better to know about that in advance. Um, and it's also worthwhile to get the measured survey drawings and I would include within that being able to get 3D scans if you can, if you can see that there are maybe things which would give you an insight into problems that have developed. Um, building condition is absolutely critical that you understand what the building condition is and although I've said might require opening up works, it probably does require opening up works. Um, again, these are problems which the more you know about them in advance, the less of a surprise it would be when you're on site and you can you can manage them. Um, we find frequently that the services that we look at within buildings um, are the things that have the, the shortest lifespan. And it's something now I would say on any, any sort of retrofit project is don't assume that all the services are going to be fine. That In fact, actually go and check at the beginning what's the lifespan left in those services because frequently we end up having to replace everything. Um, and identify if there are specific building fabric problems because you really need to deal with them first before you consider anything else. Um, the important aspects of it in this case was heritage and we, we had to start from the heritage approach, but actually that applies pretty much to lots of other specific things. So it might be in terms of the structure, it might be to do with features and details. There's probably something which is part of the essence of the building that you have to try your best to maintain. 
Um, simplifying the layouts, this is what we were trying to do here, was take away some of the later additions. And it's something that we look at quite often on um, retrofit and, re and refurbishment works on, on um, older and heritage buildings, is try and take away the layers because sometimes there are inbuilt problems because people have not looked at what happened in the past. They just keep on adding and adding. So anything that can be simplified is generally um, is going to be more efficient, it's going to work better and <clears throat> is something that it will just be easier in the long run for the subsequent changes that may have to be made. Um, definitely address the maintenance issues. Um, the big problems that we had to deal with were roof leaks. Even now, I'm not completely sure that we've we've solved all the roof leaks and we did do a substantial amount of, of um, checking and various things. Um, but it's, it's the type of thing where you can undo an awful lot of good work by not repairing any roof leaks. So anything to do with roof scutters, rainwater pipes, um, masonry walls, we, we found a number of issues at Confucius Institute where there had been a render finish had been applied on top of the original masonry, partly because we think the original masonry was a bit soft and had been wrongly bedded and it was just covered up because it was unsightly, but that was trapping water in behind it, cracks in the, the, the render were trapping water in behind it. So we eventually had to take a lot of that off and try and repair the stone as best we could within the budget um, and make sure again windows doors anything that happens at ground level anything to do with drainage these are critical items deal with them now because if you don't you'll end up paying for it down the line um, we looked at the building fabric improvements in terms of a level of consistency you know we could probably have put more insulation in some places but we wouldn't have been able to do it consistently all the way around about the, the, the whole space so we decided it was better to be consistent so that there was no one spot was going to be better or worse than the bit beside it um, and that meant that we had to really look at the type of insulation, which was timber insulation was what we were using. Um, make sure that the detailing of the junctions was as good as we could make, we could achieve. Um, we definitely improved the air tightness within there. Um, and we, we made an allowance in some places for knowing that there potentially could be further works down the line. I mean, there, there was one area of flat roof which we didn't change, but we did say, OK, we're going to design all this along the basis of, right, this is what it is now, this is what it will be in future, here's where all the junctions are going to be, so therefore this is how it's going to affect the roof. <clears throat> and actually considering the future maintenance requirements was something that was, it was it was very important to the university because obviously they're taking on this as, as um, to maintain it properly. But we did recommend that there were certain areas maybe should be looked at more frequently and there were certain things that they should specifically keep an eye on because these are the things which could easily be overlooked and could contribute subsequently to bigger problems. Um, so I mean the simplest one was actually clean, clean out the gutters more fre frequently because that seemed to be at the root of where some of the roof problems had happened and that this is not an easy building to be able to clean the roof gutters they, they have steeple jacks who come on site to be able to do that so that they're properly safe when they're, they're able to um, access all the different roof heights um, and it's something that you go do you know it's a, it's a relatively small investment up front but actually it, it manages a problem sorry, um, I, <coughs> sorry Catherine just yeah. know a few months left that's good because I've only got about three lines to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, it, again, this is something that, considering the future maintenance requirements, is something that's quite important in terms of your materials use. So we did say to them, look, there are particular things that you you really should be looking at, um, and and we gave them pointers on what to look for in terms of the stone, um, in terms of where there was um, greenery growing out of various places, um, and and by and large, how certain spaces were likely to to evolve if they didn't do that um mainly the entrance spaces and those are the bits that, and there's a bit that's quite shaded out the back which is quite slippery um so we've said right focus your attention on these bits these are more likely to deteriorate quickly if you don't do the maintenance um and, and the last thing i would say is expect the unexpected um there are plenty of stories i could tell you about the unexpected in this project um but i would say generally if something does look unusual if something catches your eye if something makes you go hmm i know what you're up to in, in, investigate further <laughs> investigate further because it, it's a it's something that you've noticed it for a reason and there are a number of problems which when in hindsight when we look back in this project to go oh yeah that was a bit funny it was a bit funny to see a bit of steel sticking out there it was a bit funny seeing that something looked a bit squint there it was a bit funny you know when we noticed that thing in the corner and you go right okay there was a reason why you noticed that and I would say, again, my experience of working on many listed buildings um, or even just heritage buildings is if something looks a bit funny, 
just look further into what, why, why does it look like that? What are you seeing? Why is it a bit different? Because it's an awful lot easier solving the problem when you know about it rather than discovering it when you're on site. And that that was a bigger problem. Uh, so really, this is, a, this is a process. It's a managed process. It's an approach that should apply to many projects. And in fact, we've got another big roofing project that we're going to go through these exact steps. And again, it has its own bespoke problems. But we're pretty sure that if we follow these steps, and there are many specific sustainability things we want to add with that, but actually what you're doing is focusing on the right things at the right time and managing it in the long term. And then share that information with everyone. I think that's the important thing as well. Make sure that everybody is part of this process. They all ask, can ask questions at any time. And it's something that they are comfortable then taking on the management in the long run. So that, that would be me and, and hopefully I can hand back to you this time properly. Super, <clears throat> superb. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, uh, I've made the, we've made the decision not to go into answering the questions uh, just now. Um, what we're going to do is we've gathered all the questions um, and we're going to then ask the questions to the speakers. And then over the next day or two, then we will post the answers on the questions onto the CIAT Scotland East channel, uh, YouTube, uh, LinkedIn channel rather. So where we have that post that's talking about the event and has the registration link to the event, there we'll start the conversation or rather continue the conversation with some of the questions being asked on the chat function just now. Um, and we'll, 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 um, we'll keep that conversation going. This will This has been recorded. And uh, once we get it, have time to edit it, and once we upload it into onto YouTube, onto the CIA T or CIA Technology YouTube channel, and CEDA may do the similar thing. We'll do a post on the uh, LinkedIn page to let you know when that's up and when you can access that. Right, I am conscious it is just slightly after two, and uh, thank you to both of our uh, speakers for keeping to time and for uh, giving us a deeper insight into your thought processes, your workflows, your methodologies, the applications of these different uh, retrofit uh, techniques to very, very different and often very unique archi uh, Scottish archetypes. So thanks again to both Catherine and Julio for speaking today. Right, we'll end it there just now because we're keen for you all to, to go away and come back to our next one. So our next CIA CIAT Scotland East retrofit event will be next week on the 22nd, uh, Thursday 22nd of July, same time, one o'clock, and we'll be uh, uh, exploring another uh, method of retrofit going around the Enerfit methodology for uh, mass retrofit processes. So. If you if you left a comment or a question in the chat box, I will we'll take a note of that just now. We'll we'll coordinate with the speakers, get you some answers, and post them on LinkedIn eventually. But for now, thanks very much again to Catherine uh, and to Julio and to Cida for for co-hosting this event. And on behalf of CIAT Scotland East Region, thank you to everyone who has joined and participated in the comments. And we'll look forward to seeing you all next Thursday. So goodbye for now.